I view San Francisco almost as a sibling or a, a parent or something. I just love the city. I love everything about it. When I'm away from it, I miss it like a, a person. I grew up in San Francisco kind of all over the city. We had pretty much the run of the city because we lived pretty close to Polk Street. And so we would, in the summer, we'd walk all the way down to Aquatic Park. And winter, we'd walk down to the main library, to the kids section, and just hang out there. In those days, the city was very safe, so nobody worried about us running around. I went to elementary school at Spring Valley, so it was right over the hill from Chinatown, and I was one of the only non-Asian kids in my school, so that was kind of fun just to experience being in a minority, which most white people don't get to experience um, that often. Everything was just really within walking distance, so it made it really fun. When I was a teenager and we didn't have a lot of money, we could go to Sam Woe's and get wonton soup for two bucks and <laughs> things like that. It was a great place to be a teenager. My uh, parents came here from the East Coast in the 50s. They both were, wanted to be writers, and they were very drawn to North Beach and to the Bohemian culture, the beatnik culture. They wanted to uh, meet Ferlinghetti and Ginsburg and all of those writers who were so famous at the time. But my mother had some serious mental illness issues and I don't think my father was really aware of that. And those didn't really become evident until I was about five, I guess. And then their marriage blew up. And my mother took me all over the world. Some, most of those adventures ended up in disaster of one kind or another because she would inevitably become hospitalized. So when I was about f six, I guess, my mother took me to Japan. And that was um, a very interesting trip where we went over with a boyfriend of hers and he was working there. I remember the open sewers and gigantic frogs that lived in the sewers and things like that. Mostly I remember the smells of things very intensely, um, but I loved Japan, it was, it was wonderful. But towards the end, my mother had a breakdown and this sort of was the cycle. We would go somewhere, we would stay for a few months or a year or a certain amount of time and then she would inevitably have a breakdown. We always came back to San Francisco, which I guess gave me some sense of continuity and that was probably what kept me sort of somewhat stable as a kid. My mother hated to fly, so she would always make us take ships places. So on this particular occasion, when I was, I think, 12, we were on the ship getting ready to go through the Panama Canal and she had a breakdown on the ship. So she was put in the brig and I was pretty much left to wander the ship until we got to Florida a few days later and, and then I was rescued by a distant cousin who was kind enough to come get us and claim us. And then the following year we actually did make it to England and I lived there for a year with her and went to school there and then ultimately she ended up hospitalized again. So, and I ended up that time in a children's home. I think I always knew I was a writer on some level, but I kind of stopped when I became a cop. I used to write short stories, and I always thought, someday I'm going to write a book about all these crazy adventures my mother took me on. Then when I came, went into the police department, I really found that I turned off certain parts of my brain, and uh, the creative part really did get shut down. I felt much more I had to learn to conform, which was not anything I'd really been taught, but felt very safe to me. I think I was drawn to police work because after coming from such chaos, it seemed like a very organized, very stable environment. And even though chaotic things happen, it was like putting order on chaos. And that felt very safe to me. My girlfriend and I were sitting in Vesuvio's bar and I looked out the window and I saw a police car and there was a woman who looked just like me driving the car. And for a moment, I thought it was me. And I turned to my friend and I said, I think I'm supposed to do this. It was like I just saw myself driving in this car. And as, as a child, we never really thought of police work as a possibility for women because there, were, there weren't any until the mid 70s. So I had only begun to even notice that there were women doing this job. And when I saw her, it suddenly seemed like that was what I was meant to do. And one of my bosses at Ben Johnson's had been a cop, and I said, you know, I had this weird idea that I should do this. And he said, I think you'd be good at it. And he went and he got me the application. The consent decree had just been enacted. There had been a huge lawsuit. And so the city was trying to bring in as many women as possible. So the department was forced to hire us. And because of all of the 
the posters and the big recruitment drive, we were under the impression that they were gl glad to have us. But in reality, most of the men did not want the women there. And so the big challenge was really constantly feeling like you had to prove yourself and feeling like if you did not do a good job, you were letting down your entire gender. Finally took a, a inspector's test and passed that and then went down to the Hall of Justice and worked different investigations for the rest of my career, which was fun. <laughs> I, I just felt sort of buried alive in all of these cases, these unsolved mysteries that, you know, there were just so many of them and some of them I didn't know if we'd ever be able to solve. And um, so my boss was able to get me out of the unit. He transferred me out. And a couple of weeks later, I found out I had breast cancer. So my intuition that the job was killing me was right. <laughs> it was. I ended up leaving. And by then, I had 28 years or 29 years in, I think. The writing thing really became intense when I was going through treatment for cancer because I felt like there were so many parts of my life that my kids didn't know about. They had never heard my story. They didn't know why I didn't have a relationship with my mother, why we had no family to speak of. It just kind of poured out of me. I gave it to a friend who's an editor and she said, I think this would be publishable and I think people would be interested in this. I am so lucky to live here. Thank God, no matter what else my parents might have done, they moved to the city. I am so grateful that they did that. It never gets old.